I'm I'm Kevin Carter, uh, the web guy at, at Casey Stengel chapter of uh, Saber and NYC. Tonight we have uh, Justin Kinney. He's going to talk to us about baseball's uh, union association, a short, strange life of an early major league, and we'll try to have a, a Q and A at the end. Uh, thank you for coming, and take it. Away. All right, well, thank you for having me, uh, Kevin, and right, well, I'm going to get started me, uh, here. Um, apologies for the feedback. I'm not sure what the cause sure is. So if anyone has solutions, please. So in my way, I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to share my screen. We'll get started. So yeah, we're just gonna talk about yeah, the Union Association and its brief history, history from 1883 to 1885. So we'll get right into it. So for context, for it's context, good to know what was going on in baseball at the time the Union Association formed. The American Association in 1882 was a rival to the National League, so it was the first, like, of the second major league, so to speak. And after the season, uh, both teams engaged in, both leagues engaged in a serious bidding on players, and so players were jumping contracts and signing with teams across the leagues, and this was seen as untenable uh, for the uh, uh, for the success uh, and health of baseball, because salaries were going up, and it became, up and it became uncertain about who would be playing for who, and so the owners decided to do something about it, and so they signed something that was called the Tripartite Agreement, also known as the National Agreement, and it was signed by the National League, the American Association, and the Northwestern League prior to the 1883 season. Um, and this put in place the 10 player reserve rule. The reserve rule had been invented sort of around 1879 to sort of allow teams to control players, but this expanded that. And um, it also meant that all the leagues were working together to ensure that uh, contracts would be respected and players would not be able to jump rosters and things like that. Um, and each club in those leagues could reserve up to 10 players the coming year. Um, this didn't mean that those players had signed contracts, but that um, even if they hadn't signed, they, the rights still belonged to the original teams. And this agreement ensured peace uh, for the 1883 season, which proved to be the most successful season to date. Um, the Philadelphia Athletics won the pennant uh, in the American Association, and they actually set a baseball attendance record with uh, over 200,000 fans across about 50 home games. And so baseball was kind of booming at this point in time. Uh, and towards the end of the 1883 season, uh, the Union Association sort of enters the fray. Uh, they were announced officially, I think on September 12th, uh, 1883, um, at a meeting in Pittsburgh and the plans for an 18 league, uh, they would ignore the reserve rule. Um, and this, they set up their intentions that they would rival the American Association and the National League by putting clubs in league cities. Uh, and they were formed by a guy called Al Pratt, who had founded the Pittsburgh Allegheny Club in 1880, which is now known as that's the Pittsburgh Pirates. And he managed the club before we fired in mid 1883. And Washington Nationals owner uh, Henry B. Bennett was named the league's first president. Um, there's a woodcut of Al Pratt on the left as he appeared in August of 1883, and Henry B. Bennett as he appeared as a young man. And so 1883, uh, in the off season, heading into 1884 season, um, I guess you sort of saw baseball at its biggest um, state to date, so to speak. So um, 1883 saw seven fully professional leagues in take the field uh, with and there were 48 teams um, across those seven leagues with 16 major league teams, uh, eight in the NL and eight in the American Association. Um, and they had also expanded into New York and Philadelphia, uh, which had been without major league teams since 1876. 
and then the formation of the Union Association in fall of 1883 set off a domino of expansion uh, at the major and minor league level. So the Union Association formed, that means eight more new teams. The American Association expanded from eight teams to 12 teams in large part to try and thwart the Union Association. They put teams in cities where the Union Association was looking at putting teams. And in the case of Washington, they actually put a team in Washington to rival the, the Union Association Club. The Eastern League formed as well as another minor league and the Northwestern League, which is probably the best league in the country outside of the two major leagues uh, in 1883. Um, they expanded from eight to 12 teams and there's a number of other minor leagues that formed across the country and in Canada. And so um, one thing that you will notice if you ever know anything about the Union Association is that they did not put a team in New York City uh, or Brooklyn, despite that area being the largest metropolitan area in the country in 1883. Um, Philadelphia ended up being a team and they were the second largest market in the country, but New York was sort of, um, ended up not being a Union Association territory, in large part because of a guy called James uh, Projector Jackson, who was a New York-based press agent. Um, and he had been involved in the early days of the association. So if you see any notices about the Union Association sort of right as this form, James Jackson's name is front and center as being one of the organizers. Um, and he was tasked with putting a team in the New York area, but he was a famously unreliable character. Um, he was known to be someone who um, spoke out of town a lot, made a lot of boasts that he couldn't back up and later ended up having some interesting run-ins with the law. Uh, but he claimed to have convinced uh, Brooklyn Gray's slash daughter's owner, Charles Byrne, that um, he was going to move the club to the Union Association. So he said this was going to happen. And then Byrne issued a, a stern rebuttal to this uh, lie. And then Jackson sort of was sort of shamed out of any further role with the league. And as a result, the Union Association did put a team in New York City. Um, and then... At this point, the Union Association is still very much like a, an idea more than a reality. And it sort of all changed once Henry Lucas entered the fold. Um, in late October of 1883, um, Lucas, who was a 26-year-old millionaire from St. Louis, officially joined the league with plans to put a club in his hometown. Um, his entrance sort of turned the league from a concept to full-fledged reality in large part because he had lots of money and was willing to spend it to... Uh, get the ball rolling. And he soon became the league's dominant figure and president. And if you read anything about uh, the league in most histories, um, he's a central, central figure and often gets credited with inventing, the, with founding the league, but that's not quite true. Um, and he made a huge splash by targeting established and reserved major league stars. Um, this included Fred Dunlap, who at the, that time was the best second baseman in baseball, Oedric Schaefer, who was a hard hitting outfielder, and Dave Rowe, who was another talented uh, versatile player from the American Association. And this drew the ire of baseball's establishment and kicked off a tumultuous war between the Union Association and virtually every league and team in the country. And so what ended up happening is the Union Association kind of stands alone and everyone's against them. And uh, it's, yeah, that's sort of the, the tone for the heading into the 84 season is them against the world. And there's a picture of Henry Lucas as he appeared as a older man uh, in the, I think, circa 1902. And on the left, there's Dave Rowe, uh, featured in a St. Louis Maroons uniform, which is one of the few existing photographs of a Union Association player in Union Association uniform. And then Fred Dunlap, as he appeared in 1887, um, he was known as the king of second baseman, and he proved to be the best player in the Union Association. And so as the league um, offseason unfolded, uh, the teams had to be constructed. Um, many of them started from scratch without any sort of previous uh, experience, they, they formed from, from nothing, so to speak. And uh, essentially what happened is you have eight teams and each of those teams took vastly different approaches to building a roster. Uh, some went very cheap, some went high end, and the result was a, a, quite a mix of, of quality. Um, and so in this case, Altoona, which is kind of became sort of infamous, um, as one of the weakest clubs in the league, they had signed low-level minor league players and semi-pros, and only one player on the roster had major league experience. Well, Baltimore and Chicago, um, they were under syndicate ownership, so they were owned by a guy called Albert H. Henderson, um, and he ended up signing mostly players from the Northwestern League um, because they were sort of more affordable, but still had 
talent and only Hugh Daly, um, who is a one arm pitcher. Um, he was actually missing his uh, left hand after a childhood accident and had started for Cleveland in 1883, pitched a no-hitter in 120 games. Um, he was the only sort of big star that they signed for the 1884 season. Boston, they went with a mix of aged and problematic Boston legends and local youngsters. So they signed Tommy Bond, who had won well over 200 games in the late 1870s, it was probably the best pitcher of, of the early National League, uh, but had basically by the age of uh, 24, had thrown nearly 4,000 Indians and his arm was wrecked and he hadn't pitched regularly since 1880. So he was signed from the scrap heap. And then Tommy McCarthy, uh, who to date is only Union Association player in the Hall of Fame, he was signed from the Boston Sandlots to play for Boston. And Cincinnati, they went with a few players who had been major league regulars and a mix of Midwestern talent. Philadelphia, uh, the Keystones, they ended up following a similar approach to Boston. Um, they signed a bunch of aged Philadelphia legends and local youngsters, uh, including uh, Jack Clements, um, who uh, became one of the best catchers of the of the 19th century. Um, but they also mixed him in with guys like Le uh, Levi Mayo, uh, who won the first batting title in 1871, but hadn't played regularly uh, since 1877. And then St. Louis was undoubtedly the strongest club in the league. They had multiple established stars in their primes, uh, and opening day featured seven players who were major league regulars in 1883. So they were undoubtedly the strongest club in the league as the season started. And then the Washington Nationals were for mostly of Washington, Washington natives, or uh, players who lived there and worked for the government. And then um, the 1883 club was a semi-pro club with a couple of former major league players, but that was sort of putting the nucleus of the Nationals in 1884. And there's a woodcut of the St. Louis Unions slash Maroons as they appeared on um, just around opening day uh, in April 1884. And here's a photo of the Boston Unions as they appeared probably in uh, April or early May of 1884. And it's one of the only, uh, it's the only known team photograph of, of a Union Association Club in full uniform. And then here's a photo of the Washington Unions, Washington Nationals as they appeared uh, in August of 1884, um, as the other known team photo of a Union Association club. So there's very little photographic evidence of Union Association, so I'm happy to include those photos here. And so based on how the teams were made up and how they formed, um, there was a lot of competitive imbalance. And so from opening day onward, it was clear that the league um, had these issues. Um, St. Louis uh, proved to be a class of the league, and they started the season 20-0, and, and if you've been following uh, the current season, Tampa Bay started the season 13 and 0, which is sort of a modern record, but you may have heard about the St. Louis Maroons opening the season uh, with a longer winning streak. Um, but this this winning streak was uh, a bit dubious in that it included eight blowouts of the pathetic Altoona club. I think they outscored in 94 to 19 in those eight games. It was, you know, not, not even close. And then um, Washington and Philadelphia were also clearly overmatched. Um, and as a result, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Boston were the class of the league. They, they sort of finished in the first division. Um, and if you've looked at the Union Association standings before, you'll notice there were more than eight teams that appeared in the league. So we'll get to what happened. So Altoona was the first casualty. Um, they struggled on the field and they were completely overwhelmed by all but the worst clubs. And so attendance was poor. And even though they had probably the lowest salary list in the league, um, I, I believe their signing players were out $1,000 a season, which was quite modest for the time. Um, the club was losing money. And on May 31st, uh, after playing their last game, uh, and with a 6-17 and 17 record, uh, they basically gave up the ghost and they disbanded. Um, Lucas had refused to give money to the club owners to cover their debts because he recognized both that there was little chance those debts would be repaid and also that um, Altoona's poor play on the field was uh, not going to improve and was also kind of making the league look bad. And so that put the league down to seven teams. So that meant they had to find a replacement. And there's a photo of the 1883 uh, version of the Altoona club. There's no, no, there's no photo of the 1884 club that's known, but the 1883 club featured a number of the same players on the team as 1884. So I like that photo as well. And so Kansas City um, was selected to replace Altoona. Um, and so they formed basically from dust and less than 10 days uh, after um, Altoona folded, they were they debuted on June 10th. Um, and they were actually the first professional club in the history of Kansas City and also the first major league club in the history of Kansas City. Um, and though they struggled on the field, they ended up doing quite well at the gate. Um, there was quite a lot of 
interested in the club uh, all season. And the next club to fold was the Philadelphia Keystones. Um, they disbanded on August 8th, so just about five, after about four months into the season, um, with $10,000 in debt and a 21 and 46 record. They were soon replaced by the Eastern League champion Wilmington Club, which had gone 51 and 12 in the Eastern League. It was running away with a pennant, um, but had lost money and were looking to recoup the cup, some of those losses. And so they joined the Union Association to replace the Keystones. But then they went just 2 and 16 and they disbanded uh, a month later. And so mid September, uh, you know, there's another opening. Um, and then the Chicago Club, they, they had struggled at the gate and on the field. Um, and we're often drawing less than 300 fans a game. And they moved to Pittsburgh in late August. Um, and then they merged with Baltimore in mid-September. If you remember that Chicago and Baltimore were both owned by the same person. So essentially two clubs be became one in mid-September. And that left with Wilmington departed and with Chicago slash Pittsburgh departed, that left two more openings for the coming season. On the left is a photo here of Ted Sullivan, who ended up taking, he started the season managing the St. Louis uh, club and with a record of 29 and four, he quit the club after a dispute with his star players. And he soon became one of the key stockholders and uh, on-field manager for the Kansas City Club. And then Albert H. Henderson, who was the owner of the Chicago and uh, Baltimore clubs. And despite these failures and despite the tumultuous nature of the league, there were some successes. Uh, St. Louis dominated the league and they turned a profit with excellent attendance that rivaled uh, the Brown Stockings and the Brown Stockings, as we know, are now the St. Louis Cardinals um, and were one of the burgeoning and premier franchises in all of baseball. And so the fact that um, Henry Lucas's St. Louis club could do battle with them and, and, and earn the respect of local fans was quite positive. Um, the Washington Nationals were a weak club on the field, but they actually beat out the American Association franchise um, in the battle for fans and on the field. And as a result, the Washington club in the American Association actually folded in early August. So the Nationals kind of beat out the American Association um, and drew quite well, um, and they were one of the most clubs in the league. And then Kansas City, like I said, drew large crowds, um, often drawing 8,000 fans for their Sunday games, and uh, they were famous for having uh, a lot of guns firing off in the crowd from rowdy cowboys and things like that, uh, either in celebration or to, to intimidate umpires and opposing players. Um, but the club made a significant profit as well, even though they were pretty awful on the field. I think they went to 16 and 63. And so with the two spots open in, in the Union Association, uh, that required two more clubs to join. And so by mid-September, the Northwestern League, which was, again, probably the strongest league in the country outside of the three major leagues, was running off hubes, and only a handful of clubs were still in existence. Uh, the Union Association had, was down to six teams, needed two more spots. And so Milwaukee and St. Paul uh, agreed to join the league. Uh, Milwaukee had the luxury of completing um, a schedule that would require them only to play at home, so that meant pure profit, while uh, St. Paul would have to play on the road, which meant that each game they would be playing solely for the $75 uh, guarantee that would be paid out by the home team to the visiting club. And so there really wasn't any way to make for them to make money, but they just kind of wanted to complete the season and keep playing ball, I guess. And so as the season came to a close, uh, St. Louis easily won the pennant. Uh, they went 94 and 19. Uh, Cincinnati actually finished in second place with the 69 and 36 record but um in early august they had signed uh, jack glasscock and jim mccormick from cleveland and they were two again hall of fame cowboy players and cincinnati after that point was incredibly strong and probably by the end of the season they were like likely on par in terms of quality with st louis uh, milwaukee was also very strong they went eight and four they drew really well at home uh and they pioneered um with a strong three-man rotation. So they had three pitchers who were equally effective, um, including Ed Cushman, who in the first his first game in the Union Association, he pitched a no-hitter. And then in his second game, he pitched eight no-hit innings and then allowed a hit in the ninth inning. And so he almost did the Johnny Vandermeer thing in 1884. And Baltimore and Boston also pitched about 500. And so there was some decent clubs in the league. It wasn't all just futility. Um, but despite this, uh, the the Union Association, as we know, did not last uh, past 1884. Um, there were significant plans for the, the league to take the field in 1885, 
um, several of the league's Eastern clubs withdrew from the league and there were plans to go forward as a fully Western league um, with St. Louis sort of being the anchor. Um, and these plans were well in the works into, into January 25, uh, but at this point, uh, league president and St. Louis owner Henry Lucas, he made an agreement with the National League to move his club there. Um, and this kind of killed the Union Association uh, because without his money and his uh, influence, there just wasn't enough um, support to sustain it. Um, and so, yeah, it collapsed. But uh, that's not the end of the story for the Union Association or its clubs. Uh, St. Louis joined the National League, and then um, Washington ended up joining the Eastern League, and they won the pennant there. And Kansas City and Milwaukee joined the Western League, which sort of flowed out of the ashes. The Union Association is the closest thing we have to like a, a Union Association in 1885. Um, and both Washington and Kansas City ended up joining the National League in 1886. So in 1886, you had three former Union Association alumni clubs taking the field. Um, not surprisingly, they finished sixth, seventh, and eighth. Uh, so they were not very strong, but um, there's some nice photos. Here's a photo of the 1886 St. Louis uh, Maroons, AKA Black Diamonds. They were called the Black Diamonds in part because they had so many players who've been blacklisted on the roster. And you'll notice they have a little diamond on their chest of the uniform. There's a photo of the 1886 Kansas City Club uh, known as the Cowboys. And um, here's the 1888 photo of the Washington uh, Club. Um, and both Kansas City and Washington end up disbanding uh, after the 1889 season. And St. Louis was moved to Indianapolis in 1887. So the United States kind of like by the end of the decade, there's no more teams left who could claim to have appeared in the league. And so that brings me to the final kind of bit here. Um, the question I get them asked the most often, and I've done quite a few of these talks with different Sabre chapters, is uh, is the Union Association a major league? Um, I think there's a famous Bill James essay in the um, one of its abstracts that sort of really grips into the Union Association and its uh, credentials and bona fides as a major league. Um, and he uses some pretty potent statistical arguments to make the case that it, it should not be considered as such. Um, and I think undoubtedly, um, it's probably the weakest major league, save for the early seasons of the National Association, which does not have distinction as a major league, but I, I consider it as such just for um, historical purposes. Um, and so I think that's like perfectly like logical and reasonable to state is that, you know, from a statistical standpoint, it is a very weak league uh, compared to other leagues of the time and going forward. Um, one of the issues the Union Association ends up having is that it doesn't have a real strong, distinct legacy. Um, other leagues sort of have a strong legacy, like the National League is still with us, the American League is still with us. You know, the, the Players League uh, sort of uh, sort of helped uh, progress the fight between players and owners and fights for the rights of players and things like that. Um, but uh, the Union Association doesn't quite have anything specific like that. Uh, it did give us Kansas City's first team. It did feature a record number of California players and Canadian players. So it shows how baseball was expanding um, its reach in terms of interest. Um, and it also sort of is an early starting point in this battle between players and owners for player freedom and abilities for players to have freedom of movement. Um, but it, it doesn't have a distinct thing that people really identify with strongly. Um, but it's important then we can look at the statistically and say, oh, it's, it's not a major league. And we can look at it, so lack of legacy, but I think it's worth considering the context of when it was created and what happened to it um, to really, that I think those things really establish its major league status. Um, notably, um, organized baseball saw the UA as an issue and did their best to undermine and kill it. And that included uh, trying to block out teams, <laughs> trying to steal new players, uh, it weaponized the reserve rule to make it like a real tool to try and punish players and keep them from jumping ship. And then also when they had the chance to get Lucas and St. Louis to join the National League, they did so in large part because they wanted to kill the Union Association because they thought it was, if not a full on threat, it was a nuisance and they want to get rid of it. And then finally, there's the historical tradition of just how it's been perceived, um, basically from the starting the start of sort of baseball historical research, it's been credited as a major league, so I just see no reason to change it. So that includes Al Spink, who um, he was the founder of the Sporting News, and he was a St. Louis native, and he later claimed that he worked for Henry Lucas uh, in the Union Association, but he wrote uh, one of the first baseball histories in 
1910 uh, called uh, the National Game. And in that book, he he speaks very positively of the Union Association, the St. Louis Maroons. He includes photos of St. Louis Maroons players, and he he gives it full credit as a major league along with other leagues. Um, and then one of his disciples is Ernest Lanigan, who invented the RBI and was an early baseball statistician. And he actually wrote the first baseball encyclopedia called the Baseball Encyclopedia in 1922. And he also gives full credit to uh, the Union Association as a major league. And he later became the main, his, the head historian of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And he discipled Lee Allen, who again, sort of would have been influenced by Spink and Lanigan and, and the perceptions of the Union Association and the league. And so when the Macmillan Encyclopedia came out in 1969, it's kind of like redefined a baseball historical record um, and standardized what was the major league, it standardized stats as we know them um, for his basis for things like baseball reference and things like that. Um, they, you know, Lee Allen's on the committee that helps name the Union Association and major leagues. And so from that perspective, since at least 1910, through 1970 and beyond, it's been considered a major league, so I just see no reason as such to change its status. Um, and so that concludes my talk. I do have this book, uh, Baseball's Union Association, um, came out in October, and I found it yesterday. I, I was named a uh, winner for the 2023 Sabre Baseball Research Award, so I'm very proud of that. And it's a fine book, um, so it's available wherever books are sold. Um, and yeah, so I'll wrap it up. Uh, if you want to get hold of me, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Email is good as well. So um, I'll just stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take any questions or if people have comments, please let me know. No, don't, don't, don't shut off quite yet. Okay. Kevin, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. I thought we were doing it, but um, if anyone could just ask a question and un unmute themselves beforehand and then remember to mute themselves afterwards. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Justin. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank congratulations, you. Congratulations on your research award. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's quite, quite, quite nice to hear. So. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, I've been a member of the Casey Stengel channel for three years, and this is uh, the first time I've ever been on a Casey Stengel meeting. It was very interesting. Very interesting because I'm on the 19th century uh, baseball committee and they actually did a uh, that's run by uh, Peter Mancuso and Bob Bailey. I don't know if you know who those gentlemen are. Yeah, yeah, well, they're, they're great people. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, okay, I've, so uh, yeah. they, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I missed it, but they did a, a one, somebody else did a segment on the one of, on one of their presentations. They also did a segment on the Union Association. I happened to miss it. So now, I, now I'm able to get it. Mm -hmm. And here's yeah. a trivia question. I don't know if anybody else can answer this, but it was a play named John Quinn, who started his career in the Union Association in 1884, ended his career in the American League in 1901. So I, to my knowledge, he's the only one to have played in both the Union Association and the American League. Yeah, uh, Joe Quinn, yeah, because he played through 1902, um, debuted in 1984, and then... Oh, was um, it 02? Okay. Yeah, and Al Mall, um, but he played until 1903. He was the last guy playing in the Union Association of Alumni. Yeah, was he the only one to ever accomplish that? I, I believe Joe Quinn's the only one who played in the American League and the Union Association. Yeah, that's my question. Okay. Yeah, there's a few guys who played in four leagues, um, like... Mm -hmm. But there's no one who played in five, unfortunately, even though yeah, I had the feeling he was the only one. Okay. The thanks. timing could have been right. Cause I think uh Joe Quinn didn't appear in the American Association. I think that like messes that up because he's he the might National have Club played in the Union Association. I just remember he started yeah. in 1884 in the Union and ended in 1902, whatever it was in the American Association. He might have yeah. played in the correct players league, American Association. I don't know. I gotta look yeah. it up. I forgot. <laughs> But again, yeah. it's my first time ever at a Casey Stengel meeting, and the uh, presentation was very informative and uh I'm good. I you logged on. Great. Well, thank you. Jason, could you see the chat questions? Uh, let me pull that up here. Yeah, I see them here. Um, yeah, so who is the best player in the Union Association? Um, so that, uh, so there's a couple ways to look at that. So the best player in 1884 in the Union Association was undoubtedly Fred Dunlap. He led the league in just about every offensive category. He also managed the St. Louis uh, unions to the pennant. Um, and 
yeah, he had an incredible year and he was the best second baseman in baseball um, for the first part of his career. Um, his career is fairly short, so he only played about, yeah, Fred done that, yes. Yeah. Okay, I, I have another question. Is Tony McCarthy the only player on the Union Association to be in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, yeah, Tom McCarthy is the only one. Um, and oddly enough, he was probably the worst everyday player in the Union Association in 1884, if you look at war, because mm -hmm. he was, he, he, he hit 201, um, he was bad defensively, and he pitched like eight starts and was awful. So if you, his, he's got like something like negative three war in about 70 games. All right, well, he got better on later on. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a good ball player, but he's, he's, he's a weak Hall of Famer. Um, yeah, I would say he's kind of weak, yeah. Yeah, but um, Jack Glasscock and Jim McCormick are probably the two best, like, have the best careers of oh. anyone who played in your association. Both those guys should be in the Hall of Fame, I think. Yeah, Jack, yeah, Jack Glasscock, I agree with Jack Glasscock. Yeah, there's a number yeah, of guys he, that should be in the Hall of Fame. You got yeah, a whole his, bunch of guys in the uh, American Association that should be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, Pete I agree, Ratman, yeah, yeah. Uh, George Stovey, uh, Bob yeah. Brothers, uh, Tony Mullane, you know. Oh, definitely, yeah, what yeah. What are you going to yeah. do? They don't recognize them. They say they're inferior, and they won't look at them. Yeah, so I love it's a sort of a bias that existed. In yeah, but what are you gonna nothing you, know. you can do about it? <laughs> How it goes? Yeah, I'm 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 on your side on those on those guys. Um, yeah, they should yeah, have was a heck of a pitcher too. Especially Pete like, Browning. I mean, come on, three, yeah, three, Browning three, two one lifetime batting yeah. average, and he led yeah. the players league in batting, which proves he you can hit. Yeah, no, he's 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 a great ball player too. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of good guys from that era who've yeah. been kind of neglected. So, yeah. okay, that's something that this book is very much about. Is those kind of guys. Okay, well, thank um, you. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, yeah, no problem. And then the other question I saw here, uh, let me pull it up, uh, is um, given, yeah, so the, the other question about like teams folding and moving and travel. Yeah, travel was a huge issue um, because the road trips were quite long. So teams would often go on the road for six weeks or more because um, train travel was unwieldy. And Kansas City, um, a big reason why Kansas City failed to take hold as a major league city for so many years was because of the train travel, because it was actually 12 hours like west of St. Louis. And so St. Louis is the most westernmost locale in major league baseball for the longest time. And Kansas City was 12 hours west of that. And so it was just unwieldy for these trips. And the typical pattern that would happen is a team like Altoona, part of the reason they, they fold when they do is because they're about to go on a road trip and that road trip is going to cost money that they don't have. And so we'll just, we'll collect our gate receipts from home and then just call it quits. It seems to me uh, that Altoona uh, was joined, I guess they were desperate to get an eighth, eighth team. They, they were actually the it's seventh. A tiny little, it's a tiny little city in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, so I'm happy to explain about Altoona. So they were the seventh club to join. They joined in February and... Mm -hmm. Um, the reason they were chosen was because Altoona is a railroad hub between the east and west. And so every team in baseball that was going east to west or west to east would go through Altoona. Oh, and okay. so it was thought to be a, a convenient location. Um, and in 1883, they had had a minor league club that was pretty good and yeah. made money. Yeah, but what about and, fan support? Yeah, they, but they did. They, they drew quite well in Altoona because they had a surrounding area of people. Um, yeah. And they played all these exhibition games against major league clubs. They beat Pitts, the Pittsburgh Alleghenies and things like that. Really? Hmm. Didn't know but that. the issue that happens in 1884 is um, the Union Association is shut out from playing exhibition games against almost everyone because they're sort of the, the black sheep. And so as a result, um, Altoona ends up uh, not being able to play these exhibition games, which had been a big reason why they made money in 1883, and so they can't play those games in 1884, and so yeah. they fold um, as a result. But yeah, they were picked because they're a strategic hub between the East and West, and it was thought okay, to be makes sense. Yeah, like there was a reason for it. It wasn't totally random, but still not the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, travel was a huge issue, um, and teams, when they'd go on the road, they'd get paid $75 a game. Um, which wouldn't be enough to cover salaries. So you're really relying on playing at home uh, to make money. And then the two holiday games would also make money because Decoration Day, which is now Veterans Day, and July 4th, those games, you'd get a 50-50 split. Um, but it just wasn't enough for a lot of teams to, to justify going on. You made an interesting comment. The visiting teams were guaranteed $75 in... Uh, yeah. Of, that of even the, cool. I mean, that would, that would even be the price of a ticket today. Yeah, yeah. Well, tickets in the in the Union Association were twenty five cents. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, I were fifteen cents for kids, 
Yeah. And so any team that made like that averaged less than 1300 fans a game basically lost money. And any team that made over that probably made money. Um, but most of the teams averaged less than that. So okay, one last thing. Uh Susan followed up. I didn't catch that name, comma Fred. Oh, yeah, it's a uh, Fred done that. So I just typed it into the chat, but yeah, Fred done that. He was, uh, he was a really talented player. And he, he, through much of the decade, he was the highest paid player in baseball, and he was really quite well known and famous um, in his time. But his career is kind of shortened by some injuries, and I uh, played second base, which typically is a position that you don't age well, um, particularly in the nineteenth century. So um, he's sort of washed up by eighteen ninety one. But yeah, he was. He was about half of a Hall of Fame career. Like his first half of his career is exceptional. I think he was one of the best players in baseball for a big chunk of time. And so his seasonal utilization, it's it it's outlandishly in terms of OPS plus, the only person to ever beat it is Billy Bonds. Uh, but even without the union association season, he was a really great ball player in the National League great right before that. So okay. Is there anybody else? Last call for Justin. Well, Justin, thank you very much on behalf of the Casey Stengel chapter. It's great stuff. Great to see you. And good luck with the book. Thank you. And so everyone have a great night. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, nice to meet you all. And uh, yeah, if you have Cheers. any questions, I'm around. So Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night.